Our next speaker and the final one is James Bridle from UK and now a resident of Athens. Um, James will look into the electromagnetic border zones as these have emerged around Europe's hardened borders and the new possibilities which these uh, zones entrench. Um, James is uh, a, a writer, an artist, a publisher and a technologist. Um, he has authored as a journalist and a columnist several articles for prestigious newspapers including uh, The New Statesman, uh, The Guardian, um, The Observer and several others. We look forward to your presentation. Awesome, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for that introduction. Thank you for, someone's Howard's back. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, thank you to all the other speakers. It's been uh, very interesting so far. Um, I'm not going to speak about hardened borders, actually, uh, particularly. Uh, I, I spoke at Neem last weekend, and I know a few of you were there, so thank you particularly to those who've come again, um, uh, about the kind of specifics of borders and citizenship. Uh, and this evening, I wanted to speak a bit more uh, to the title of this conference towards monitorial citizenship, uh, to what I see as this kind of active citizenship, uh, and to do so because I don't really know how else to do it uh, through my own work. Um, as someone who, uh, having heard the term monitorial citizen only quite recently, uh, quite liked the idea, uh, particularly as it seemed to apply to the sort of things that I do, uh, which is always nice when someone sort of validates uh, what you think you're up to uh, by describing it in such a way. Um, and so I want to talk about something that I've done that might be considered to be monitorial citizenship, uh, but also to address what I consider to be the, the problems with that and how I'm, I'm thinking through those, um, all of which I think is relevant to various other things that have already been discussed this evening. I also know I'm the last person, so uh, we, I am the only thing standing between you and food, so I will try and be quick. Um, uh, so a, a few years ago now, quite a few years ago now, um, I read this story in the paper. Um, and it was a weird story. It was a story about uh, a, a guy in the UK who'd been living in the UK for almost a decade, uh, but had been there illegally for some time. He'd, he'd overstayed his visa and kept working and so on and so forth. And eventually the British border authorities had uh, found him, had uh, jailed him and were trying to deport him. Uh, he'd been in, the, as I say, he'd been in the UK for more than a decade. He had family in the UK. Uh, he had a certain case to make to stay. Uh, that was being kind of run through the courts as quickly as possible. Uh, he went on hunger strike, uh, which delayed his kind of forced removal. Um, but at, at this particular juncture, um, the government uh, basically uh, tried to sneak him out of the country as quickly as possible to kind of sub uh, get around the various protests that were forming around his deportation. And they actually hired a private jet uh, and put him aboard it and flew him out of the country in the middle of the night. Um, uh, unfortunately, Nigeria, the country they were trying to fly him to, refused the jet permission to land, uh, at which point it kind of circled around for a few hours, eventually landed, according to this article, somewhere in the Mediterranean, um, before eventually returning back to the UK 24 hours later uh, at vast expense to the taxpayer and having achieved absolutely nothing. Um, and this just seemed to me like a kind of completely extraordinary story about which I knew nothing apart from this article that I'd read. Um, uh, that had all these extraordinarily, extraordinary details in it that seemed to demand more explanation, but for which there wasn't really in the article. Like, uh, how come we're hiring private jets uh, to deport people? That seems extravagant. Um, where did he land, and where did this kind of flight go, and, and how does uh, the, the geography of this journey reveal um, aspects of what appears to be quite a large part of government action and policy, of which I, as a, as a citizen, was completely unaware? Um, and the first thing I started doing was uh, uh, started hunting around to see where this plane had gone on its journey. And the record I eventually found was the website of a plane spotter in Malta, um, who is just clearly a plane spotter and also a ship spotter, uh, and who records on his website for the benefits of fellow plane spotters uh, arrivals of interesting planes in and out of Malta. And on the day preceding this news article, so I'd sort of got a window for the date, uh, sure enough, on his website, there was the listing of a particular plane uh, that flew in, stayed for a few hours, and, and, then, and then left again. So I was like, ha, huh, that guy must be it. So I looked up that plane, and it turned out to be this plane, uh, which again fit the bill. Uh, a small private jet belonging to a private hire company 
Um, and so I took that information to uh, this website, which is called Flight Radar 24, uh, which I'll say briefly about if you're not familiar with it, because I think it's brilliant. Um, Flight Radar 24 is a website, uh, a public-facing website that anyone can visit that tracks uh, all of the planes, sort of. And this is where I think it starts to get, you know, there starts to become questions around this. Um, you can go to that website, you can put in any plane. Uh, you can see for free a whole week. You pay, you get more. You get all of these incredible plane journeys, and you get them in real time uh, from the point where that screenshot was taken that were the actual planes in the air at any particular time. And Flight Radar 24, as well as being an incredible public resource, is also uh, something that's created out of public participation. Uh, it's actually created by lots and lots and lots of individuals all sharing data with the central server, um, which basically involves buying a small USB stick. Um, there's more high-tech ways of doing it. For, for kind of 30 euros, you can get a USB stick in an aerial and plug it into your computer, and any planes that fly overhead will be then shared with this website. So through a kind of community public participation, you get this incredibly vast, amazing network of, of air data. Um, and it's worth mentioning that there is, that that visibility is still uh, uh, slightly controlled, right? There's a bunch of planes that don't appear on this. Uh, if you were to take it down uh, over the Salt Lake, uh, most of the planes flying in and out of that base, for example, would not appear on here. Military planes, um, largely don't send out the kind of signals which appear on this kind of system, uh, and also a lot of private planes are increasingly blocked on this si system deliberately. But by and large, Flight Radar 24 for me embodies something quite extraordinary about networks, technologies, particularly when they're empowered by large numbers of people contributing, uh, which is that um, uh, they, they produce this kind of radical visibility. Um, if, if you have a certain level of technological expertise and privilege with which to access them, right? Um, it requires a certain kind of knowledge, which weirdly, it turned out, uh, most journalists in this case didn't appear to have in that no one else kind of um, uh, had kind of looked at this. So, I, you know, I took this play and I tracked it through this website. Um, I, uh, I, I, list, I wrote about this plane in particular. I thought it was kind of interesting that this company was doing it. And after I'd written this up and put it on my website, um, I was actually contacted by um, uh, several activist groups uh, who were interested in the process of deportation that were happening. And uh, they didn't know about this either. They didn't know that this kind of tracking could be done. And they were like, wow, you know, how did you do this? So I was like, well, there's this website. Well, well, you can do it. You can look at this. And the reason that these activist groups are interested in this is because they're trying to put pressure on companies like Air Charter Scotland, who hired this plane, not to do deportation. Uh, they, the reason... Uh, private jets are frequently used in this situation is because the commercial car carriers, uh, the big public airlines, won't, in most cases, take deportations anymore since several violent, uh, violent events that occurred on them, including the death of one deportee who was killed by G4S guards on a British Airways plane. So they have to resort to private charters, uh, and there's a campaign to stop the private charters doing it either. So I explained this. They said, that's great, that's helpful. Can you tell us you know, where the plane's going next week? And I was kind of like, no, that's not how, that's not how the process works, right? Uh, surveillance and things like this, they're, they're retrospective, apparently. Um, uh, so I couldn't, you know, give them a code to kind of log in and figure this out. Um, but I could start to figure out some ways of getting that information. And this is the point when a kind of generally being overly curious with Google steps over, I think, into a kind of more active form of, of monitorial investigative citizenship. Because um, I, I, I found out about this place, uh, which is where that deportation flight had left from. Um, this is the in-flight jet center at Stansted Airport, which is a private terminal at Stansted Airport, which is a big holiday airport just outside London uh, that lots of people go on their holidays from. And um, there's a private terminal there that looks very plush, kind of like a cheap hotel. Um, where, you know, during the day, it's used for these kind of private jet flights. Um, celebrities, footballers, the kind of people who have private jets, oligarchs, uh, go through this place. And in the middle of the night, it, you know, uh, when it's not being used uh, by rich people, it's turned into a deportation terminal. Um, so basically, in order to try and um, figure out which other planes were being used, I ended up at Stansted Airport at 3 o'clock in the morning, uh, watching people being... Um, loaded off buses that suddenly started turning up there. 
um, from the various detention centers around the UK, bringing people to be deported. Um, and this was a very weird experience, you know. Um, I had some feelings about the deportation system uh, previously, I'll admit to them. Um, but particularly being there and watching something like this occur at kind of two o'clock in the morning, watching people, almost exclusively people of color, being uh, taken off buses in manacles uh, by you know, burly men in high-vis jackets at two o'clock in the morning under the cover of darkness with a police guard, um, says to me quite simply, this is something that we're not very proud of and there's probably reasons why we're not proud of this and there's probably things that are deeply wrong about this. Um, and once exposed to that to some extent, for me, it became necessary to kind of chase it down further. Um, I'm taking too long to explain this. That was the plane they were getting onto that night. Um, you know, I watched it, I got its tail number, uh, I watched it take off, and as the beginning of that, I could start to trace um, this network, it turned out to be, kind of regular service of deportation flights. That one, that night, went to Lagos and Ghana, uh, but by tracing it further, I then wrote some software to scrape the data about that flight uh, continually over the following months uh, from Flight Radar 24 um, and could build up a picture of this uh, um, was essentially a kind of private deportation airline. Now some of these are holiday flights and some of them are deportation flights. Um, but it was quite easy to work out from the timing of those flights which one of those are kind of charter holiday flights and which ones are. So this information was kind of amazingly accessible. Um, but I was still bothered by, or rather, no, I wasn't bothered. I wanted to see how far it was possible to look inside these systems using new technologies, because that's how I kind of go about these things. Um, that I try and see if there's a way in which new technology, which is by no means magic, and certainly doesn't kind of magically produce better situations in the world, but quite often it's a tool that we simply haven't tried before, so it's probably worth trying. And I'm fascinated by the fact that Technology often allows us to get only so far, to get so close, uh, and that, but that closeness is often quite an illusion. This is um, a detention center next to Heathrow Airport, um, which is you know, easily visible on um, Google Maps, uh, you know, a photograph taken of it from space, uh, but actually you have no access to it. Uh, it's actually a privatized kind of prison, so um, it's incredibly difficult to gain access. No journalists have ever gone inside. Uh, only a handful of kind of caseworkers and so on and so forth have been admitted apart from the guard. But of course, when they built this thing, um, they had to apply to the local council for permission. Uh, so the entire architectural plans of it were on file with um, the local uh, council, um, as are the architectural plans for um, uh, that place, the in-flight jet center that I showed you before. Um, also, this place that I became increasingly fascinated with, which is a building in central London, which, high, um, which contains the special court uh, in which a lot of very high class uh, and, and mostly secret immigration trials are, are performed. They actually passed a special law in the UK seven or eight years ago now for this particular court, um, which is called the Special Immigration Appeals Commission, um, which allows for the provision of secret evidence. So people can be tried in this court uh, without them or their legal team being aware of the uh, evidence uh, which is uh, being used against them, which is obviously completely in violation of any kind of a, a fair trial. Uh, but we can do it because they're immigrants, so it's fine. Um, you can actually go to this court, uh, which is supposed to be the case with uh, courtrooms in the UK, uh, except uh, half the time it's in secret session. So when that happens, you have to leave the room, as does the defendant and their legal team, while the judge and the prosecution, or rather the three judges and the prosecution, continue behind closed doors. Um, it's also illegal to take photographs of courtrooms in the UK, uh, which is an interesting and, and long-standing uh, prohibition. Um, so taking those various things, you know, um, uh, the architectural plans of these buildings, uh, various bits of eyewitness accounts that I could gather, an actual visit to that courtroom in session uh, with an architect friend who was good at sketching, um, we took those plans uh, and we, uh, we took them to an architectural practice, an architectural visualizer. Um, I don't have time now to go into the reasons why I'm fascinated by the process of architectural visualization. Um, though if you walk along the front in Limassol and look at the insane way in which the future of the city is being solved through these kind of CGI representations of um, uh, an utterly completely bonkers architecture, 
uh, you might have some idea of why I think it's interesting. Um, but what we did, we took all that information, we built it up into uh, complete 3D models of these spaces. Um, so this is, this is Field House. Um, this is the interior of that courtroom, which you're not allowed to photograph, um, uh, which is extraordinary, particularly if you're interested in the way kind of uh, structures, um, as I am, really complex, uh, non-physical structures manifest in the world as things you can kind of see and poke. Uh, this is a kind of certain parts of the legal system reified as architecture. So when you have the, um, uh, that provision for secret law, you know, that manifests in this space as, as the built environment. Uh, you have a, a, a witness box on the one side, which is, uh, can be curtained off so evidence can be given in secret. You actually have a dividing wall just here between uh, the official public bit and the bit where the spies sit so that you can't see them. Um, so just describing the architecture of the space starts to become a way of describing the actual um, system that's in operation here. Likewise, this is the inside of the detention center, um, the inside of the... Um, uh, the deportation facility, the, the, um, the private jet terminal, and so on and so forth. All of those are stills from a film, um, there it is, um, uh, which you can watch online. That's, a, in fact, a kind of architectural tour of these spaces. And the reason that I... Um, so that is an example of um, using this kind of uh, research ability through new technologies to... Um, to make visible, essentially, something that wasn't visible before. But the thing that I actually really want to mention, particularly, is um, what is being made visible here, and the utility of making certain things visible, or what we choose to make visible now in forms of activism um, and investigation. Um, so when this film was first shown at the uh, Photographer's Gallery in the UK, uh, it was alongside, it was kind of on the shiny digital wall where they put the, you know, the, the weird stuff they don't quite understand. Um, uh, next to a huge exhibition called Human Rights, Human Wrongs, which was like a deep dive through something called the Black Star Archive, which is an incredible collection of 20th century photojournalism from conflicts and crises and protests and events all across the world throughout the 20th century. And it's very much what you think of as the language of 20th century photojournalism, right? So it's mostly black and white. It's, you know, the moment of action. It's the face in the crowd. It's that kind of pinpointing a single moment from which we might kind of extrapolate a story and tell other things about it. And here, sort of the opposite is happening. I suppose to lose bullet play again. Um, um, which is that I'm not showing anybody. And I was really concerned about that. Um, I was really concerned that in, in doing this, I would not erase uh, the stories of those who actually inhabit these spaces, um, uh, which is really not my intention at all. And is also, um, but also my intention was not to kind of overwrite those stories or to avoid them. Um, uh, I think those voices should be heard of their own account speaking to themselves. What I kind of realized what I was doing was that I was showing instead the architecture of these spaces as a way of talking about the much grander system that kind of underpins them, right? The legal systems, the social systems, the political systems that produce these as, uh, that produce the deportation system as one of its kind of many outcomes. Right? I was trying to draw a picture of the entire system that produces um, uh, that particularly kind of oppressive uh, and horrific system. Because it seems to me that, that method of telling stories through particular examples, through the, the single telling detail, is, is one that hasn't really worked. Uh, in fact, that is actually increasingly um, starting to fail us as a way of, as a way of telling stories. Because um, I talk way too much about that at this evening. Um, I want to talk about one particular example of that that I think is really telling, um, which is uh, what's already been raised this evening as an example of a kind of monitorial citizenship in action, um, which is the kind of worldwide debate over the last few years over the re release of uh, the Snowden document. Right, this kind of um, huge outpouring of evidence about a particular act that occurred that sort of seemed to uh, concern everybody very deeply and yet seemed to be, um, to me at least, um, uh, effectively com completely ineffectual. 
uh, like something that actually didn't really achieve any of the things that it was supposed to, and the question and the reasons why it didn't seems to me to be really interesting. Um, so one of the really key things about the the debate around global surveillance is that it had been going on for some time. Um, that actually um, there had been a, a series of revelations for a long time before this that were merely um, not merely, but were massively kind of accelerated by the release of the Snowden uh, material. And I think it's interesting to think why that was, that this was a, primarily a, a really massive visual event, uh, right? These slides that seem to kind of characterize all of these stories, the visuals of buildings or locations, uh, it suddenly started to kind of put a, a visual language to this uh, that enabled a kind of huge amount of um, uh, uh, kind of appalled reaction and outrage around the thing. But ultimately, we know that it didn't actually succeed uh, in the fact that most of the practices that were railed against um, in the opposition to the global surveillance revelations were, in fact, um, basically had been operating in a completely gray zone beforehand. And the main thing that happened to them is that they became signed into law. The vast majority of those practices are still continuing, and we haven't yet actually found a way of kind of addressing them at all. Um, and this, to me, this is room. 641A in San Francisco, which is where an NSA, well, an AT&T contractor had reported uh, five, six years before the Snowden revelation that exactly this wiretapping of telecommunications was going on. Um, the thing is, this has been in, op in the open for years. Um, this desire to produce a kind of visual evidence of it didn't, in fact, um, uh, produce any kind of radical change. Rather, for me, it kind of solidified uh, an idea of what should constitute evidence in this kind of investigatory uh, practice um, that, was, that was purely visual, right? That was purely just a, um, a kind of spectacle of evidence, a spectacle of outrage that didn't actually do anything to uh, change the literacy of a population that wanted to try and do something about it. Um, it reinforced, in fact, the very logic of the thing that it was opposed to. Um, what struck me most about it was that the, this logic of whistleblowing, this logic of revelation, was exactly the same as the logic of the NSA itself. That the surveillance state and the kind of investigative and leaking responses to it have exactly the same view of the world. That there is some kind of secret at the heart of it, that if we only bring it into view, um, uh, everything will be kind of radically transformed by our knowing of it. Um, and as, as such, we, uh, we failed to kind of see beneath into the, the systemic um, arrangements that kind of brought that into, into being in the first place. So this is why I question these kind of um, image-based ideas of, of kind of witnessing a project, uh, witnessing projects that um, uh, uh, rely on this idea that simply by kind of exposing and bringing forth a particular, uh, a particular idea will somehow kind of produce a change. For me, the, um, uh, the kind of change that the, the, this idea of pure monitoring, of pure revelation evokes is, is kind of deeply insufficient because so much of the stuff that we, that we engage with and see in front of us every day is, um, uh, is, is, is largely invisible to us, as in like, the, the, the structures that run beneath it are not the things that we see in the surface. Technology provides us with certain tools for, um, for addressing and making visible those things. Um, but uh, but it mostly what it should hopefully do is give us the agency and the literacy to use those tools in kind of critical and questioning ways that, that you can't just, for example, in my beginning, go simply to an open website like Flight Radar 24 um, and, and take that information right out of it. In order to be fully kind of monitorial, investigative, engaged with it, it requires the kind of participation of engaging with the underlying data involved in it, uh, potentially even participating and sharing with that information, because it's not just the skill of lead using the website that's necessary at that point. It's being able to take what you learn systemically as a form of literacy from engagement with those kind of participatory uh, systems, and then moving that understanding over to see the linkages between a computational system and a legal and a social system as a series of complex systems, each of which governed by quite um, uh, complex uh, interactions, but, but each one of them being something where you can take and transfer that knowledge and apply it. I'm bumbling a little, so I'll stop, uh, but I hope that made a certain kind of sense.
Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Your work is really spectacular.